everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so happy to see you all here today. We have a whole set of excellent guests covering a wild project, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. This week's guests are working on a fascinating project, an extraordinary project, a, I believe, unique project. What they're trying to do is take a 100-year framework for understanding educational technology. That might sound kind of perverse at first glance. You're thinking, oh, this is cutting edge technology. This is new. But you can really go back into the 1950s and a little earlier for looking at educational technology and looking ahead. Ah, this lets us look at the future of education and technology. We've hosted a couple of their sessions before, but I thought it would be a good time to get an update and see how the entire project is running and what they've discovered by using their framework. So I'm going to introduce four people here, Melissa Vito, Sam Becker, Kyle Bowen, Angela Gunder, and I'm bring up one by one, and I'll ask them a question, but then it'll be over to you for your questions and your comments. So let's start off by bringing up Angela Gunder. Now, I was going to say good afternoon, Angela, but I'm not sure where you are today. Are you? <laughs> I'm uh, I'm a little south of you in Arlington, Virginia, right now. Oh heck, man! We should we should just meet and do this in the same building. This we could have been in a park. Uh, for no. those that are not in the DC metro area, it is fall weather right now in August. So we could have yeah. we could have been outside. <laughs> oh, it's it's really it's really glorious out there. That's where half of my students are right now. Um, well, I've got to ask Angela, just, just looking ahead, what are you working on for the next year? What are the big projects and big ideas for you? Yeah, so um, it's been kind of a crazy year. Uh, for those that uh, don't know me already, I'm Angela Gunder. I lead a collaboratory called Opened Culture, and that actually kicked off in uh, May of this year um, with a lot of those seeds planted beforehand with many of the folks that are on this call. Um, and the big thing that I'm doing is pulling threads that started back when I was working on my dissertation, uh, looking at open ed and really how do we make sure that open ed is guaranteed for everybody and is inclusive because a lot of the, the narrative and the, the narratives and the research that had come out prior uh, had made it seem like anybody can get into open education. But what I ended up finding out with my research was that there are a lot of obstacles and barriers um, to people being included in those spaces. So that's a lot of the work that I'm doing right now and looking uh, through Stuart Hall's uh, lens yeah. on cultural yeah. study around how do we how do we create culture that's inclusive. Wow, what a fantastic idea for a project. Um, we may just have to have you come back and just talk about this. <laughs> once you've doubled, once you've doubled your lifespan to like you know six months or something, that's right. <laughs> well, it's it's great to have you aboard, Angela. Great welcome. to be here. Welcome. Uh, let me uh, let me poke around with the screen a bit and let me bring up some more people so we can join you on stage. Let's bring up uh, Kyle Bowen because we're talking about beautiful weather and maybe maybe Kyle has some beautiful weather to share with us. How are you doing, sir? Hey, good morning. Great to see you, Brian. Yes, beautiful day here in Tempe. Bright, sunny, and warm. Mm. And it will get extra warm later today, depending upon how you prefer it. Uh, okay. So if, before you turn to a charcoal briquette, you will probably be you know, pretty well uh, until then. Kyle, what are you working on for the next year? What are the big project services and ideas that are uppermost in your mind? Well, you know, Brian, so much of the work uh, we're focused on in the next year is really around kind of you know, bringing... Uh, impactful uses of, of AI to our, our broader ASU community. As part of that, we, we've developed, uh, you know, collaborations and work and new technology to support, you know, changes in teaching and learning, uh, advancements around uh, research, particularly use inspired research, also, you know, growing out uh, the future of work and how that changes and we can streamline some of the things that people are doing. Um, mm. and, and part of that work is really, you know, kind of working deeply with uh, our colleagues at OpenAI and, and, and others to kind of explore kind of what that, help define what that future looks like. Well, uh, you guys are doing so much cutting edge work in so many fields. It's just going to be a, a wild ride to be doing this. We'd love to hear more about uh, how your AI project is going along. Um, th this sounds great. Um, and where are you on campus? Where have we found you? Uh, well, here today, I'm, I'm just right on the edge of campus. This is actually our first day of classes. So if I seem oh have extra energy today, that's why. Super excited. 
uh, to kind of get the ball rolling on a fresh year. It always feels the first day always feels like Christmas, right? It's, yeah. it, it's so much anticipation builds up and then, you know, we're just getting started. And, and we get to be Santa Claus. Uh, right. Which is great. Well, welcome, Kyle. And thank you for making time on this uh, on this you know, spike of a day. Welcome. Um, well, here, let me bring up uh, another member of your group. Uh, this is Melissa Vito. And Melissa, where where are you today now? Are you? I'm sort of that uh, where in the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I was in I, I am um, vice provost uh, for academic innovation at UT San Antonio. I'm a kind of an approved remote yet hybrid worker. So I was in San Antonio earlier this week, actually having an awesome time helping students move into their residence halls and Ooh. new families get excited and kind of feeling that energy and also having a couple of days of retreats. And, uh, and now I'm back in Tucson having um, similar weather to Kyle and um, enjoying enjoying being back in Arizona. And so I'm a, I'm a back and forth kind of person. Um, oh, okay, I can see right. that. Yeah, and so, and so your question, what am I working on? Yeah, what does the next year hold for you? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the next two, I've been really interested in how we, how you maintain a culture around innovation and creativity. Things, mm. things come to you, you know, so generative AI, we leapt into, you know, in December of 22 and have done a bunch of stuff and fairly well socialized. So it's kind of what's next. And, and so, um, I'm interested in a lot of what Kyle talked about. I would say what we're doing that I'm really proud of and we continue to play with is how we measure the impact of what we're doing. You know, we do, you do a lot. And when you innovate, you pilot stuff, you try things, we tra transform a course. You, sometimes we never go back to it. And so we've been measuring what the impact is of course transformations, of our faculty development programs, of a whole array of things. And it's been, super rewarding because we're actually finding out it makes a difference and but we have the data and so i'm interested this coming year in how we take generative ai through different aspects of our faculty and student experience and try mm. to think about what that impact is mm. and is it making a difference is a course assessment better or worse or different is it making life easier or more complicated and um, and how does it align with our you know with what we're trying to do in a in a bigger picture way, which is make sure that our students are well prepared for the workforce, and our faculty have everything they need to be dynamic, creative um, researchers and teachers. So um, interested in that, and then we're hosting some things this year that I'm super excited about. We got Educause coming up in October in San Antonio. Oh, so wow. Good for you. Go off San Antonio. And um, and then we'll be, last year we hosted the first ever UT System Conference on Generative AI. This year we're keeping that conversation going and we'll either do that again or we'll do something else around an emerging um, area. But prior to that, we will be hosting the 100 year project. And so we're super excited Great. to bring more people to San Antonio. So a mix of some super kind of cool stuff, some pragmatic things, and then some opportunities to really engage people in the kinds of conversations that pave the way for thinking about the next 50 years in higher ed. Mm -hmm. And now I want to join you in San Antonio. I think we all do. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have um, to figure out how to do this. Let's, yeah. uh, well, first of all, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, um, but let's let's add, speaking of the 100 year project, let's add its, its chief cat herder and uh, um, the uh, the evil genius behind the whole thing. Uh, let's bring up our wonderful friend, Sam Becker. Hello, Hi. Samantha. Hi, Brian. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having us on today. It's such an honor. I think this is potentially my third appearance over the last decade here. More than that. Um, More than that. I mean, all the way back to NMC days and yeah. Yeah, so it's just so fun to be back and see new and old friends alike. Um, so I'm Samantha Becker, and I'm coming to you from just outside of Chicago, Illinois, uh, where it is the week between camp and school for my daughters. So, uh, yeah, if we get interrupted, um, you know, it, it is what it is. And I feel like probably there are many others who have been in this boat. Um, 
But I am the CEO of SAB Creative and Consulting, which is a storytelling agency really dedicated to helping uh, education institutions and organizations amplify their vision and voice, articulate their worth. Uh, and often I'm doing work at the intersection of storytelling, our digital futures, Mm -hmm. um, and technology, but also accessibility and equity. So it's really a unique kind of corner of the universe that I've been able to carve out, but it's given me an opportunity to work with universities, community colleges, nonprofits that are focused on everything from lifelong learning to digital equity and access and broadband connectivity. Um, and so yeah. being able to tell stories uh, about that work is so important, um, which is a really good segue to the 100 year project, 100 year ed tech project, which is in a lot of ways about working with future stories, stories of the future yeah. uh, as a framework for better preparing for and understanding uh, the future that we may be grappling with, the known and the unknown. Um, so well, is, yeah. Well, I was gonna say, um it's it's great to see you I, I feel like i've just temporarily you know lassoed a supernova um and uh um, and all four of you um this is a a, a brilliant constellation uh, to bring on stage let me actually let me just adjust the camera a little bit and just make things a, a little a little more even in fact i could i could do this a little a little fancier here like this you know kind of a, a, you know, nice okay. set of slides yeah let's stay right here yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and hello to everyone who's just joined us in the past few minutes. Um, welcome. You know, we're here in the Future Trends Forum. And a, a question I want to put to you, I guess, Sam, you're the best one to answer this, is tell us what the 100 Years EdTech Project is right now. What are you all about? What are you working on? Right now, it's very much a community and a grassroots one at that. Um, it's a community of people from different education, learning-focused organizations higher ed, K-12, museums, public sector, industry, uh, because ultimately our belief is when we are planning anything for the future of education, it needs to be a concerted and collective uh, effort. This means students too. So really we're looking at um, people touching every aspect of learning and education and especially education and technology, bringing those voices together to actually get out of the day to day, you know, right now is the first day of school for some people, first week mm -hmm. of school, yeah. and it's really easy in our day jobs. And even in some of the forecasting reports out there to get sat in today, tomorrow, the next four to five years. But um, as far as we know it, there's not necessarily this collective effort towards defining and guiding uh, the next 50 years by also considering the last 50 years because yeah. it has happened and our history helps kind of define and inform next steps. Uh, so right now we're a community that came together really for the first time in, at Arizona State University, who is a founding partner of this. Um, at We gathered at Sky Song in Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, last February and March, actually on, on Leap Day, which was really symbolic. Uh, cool. to make a leap together. Uh, our yeah. friend Joe Lambert from Story Center yeah, joined yeah. us and ahead of this event, um, a core planning committee that represented, you know, these various groups um, essentially helped define what 10 future scenarios would be uh, based on what we saw happening in the field, looking, doing environmental scans, looking across all the reports um, from the reputable uh, organizations and um, issues like climate change, ethical AI integration um, in curriculum, teaching in a post-truth era, historical revisionism and XR kind of surface to the top, uh, mental well-being in the digital age. And so ultimately science fiction style stories read by real people, but enabled by AI um, led people with facilitators around different ways to design approaches and solutions uh, to what we see as the greatest opportunities and challenges over the next 50 years. Um, and the link I shared earlier uh, is one of the yeah. first fruits of our labor, you know, one year old, their very first publication guiding the next 50 years. It's, it's called the guide to 2074. Um, and so you can get a sense of how each of the working and design groups grappled with each of these significant topics. Um, I'll stop there to see if any of my colleagues would like to join in by missing anything. 
Well, we, we, we'd love to hear from you. Just just quick note on the bottom left corner of the screen, you should see a couple of buttons uh, that will take you to more information about this, including the 100 Year Air Tech Project uh, homepage, as well as a link to their design summit coming up, which we'll hear more about. So what, why, don't, why don't you all tell us, what's your particular take on this project? How does the 100 Year Air Tech Project play out, say, um, you know, Melissa, in your in your work in San Antonio? I actually, it couldn't align more perfectly. What, what I didn't say when I was talking about what I'm doing over this next year is that I'm really interested in how we do think about the future. And one of the things that um, I'm working with, um, with the, our honors dean is how we can pilot some future literacy um, courses for our students to start thinking about how you develop um, a resilient mindset with expectations for dynamic change. Knowing, learning as much as you can about the environment and understanding what impacts it, but absolutely expecting that there will be change and that we need to keep moving and, and know that it isn't something that we've done, it's something that is built into, baked into our environment and how do we take advantage of that? So we opened our system conference around generative AI with a futurist who runs a forecasting lab in Houston and kept that theme going. Generative AI is a manifestation of it right now and a tool for us, but there will be more things coming forward. So for me, I'm, it's like I found my spirit program uh, and am um, really interested in, you know, and how we anchor what we're thinking by actually growing out the, the, the 50 yard line and thinking about how we can get there, what it means, like how do we play with our scenarios and how will we 50 years from now look back? I probably won't, but some may and say, whoa, that one was pretty close. This one, not so much. And mm -hmm. so I, I think this project forces us to escape the constraints that we have on a daily basis. And that's what I'm trying to do in little and big ways in my work at San Antonio. Does that make sense? It, it makes a lot of sense, but just really quickly, I'll toss a link in the chat um, for your future literacy stuff. Um, I'm on the board of the uh, Teach the Future project, um, and we've hosted them a couple of times in the program. So if, we, if that would That's be great. of use, please, you know, happy to happy to hear from all of you. Perfect. Thanks. Well, uh, uh, speaking of the uh, of the Southwest, Kyle, what, what does ASU and how does your work bear on the 100 Year EdTech project? You know, one of the things that I love about the 100 Year uh, Project is that it's so deeply rooted in stories, right? And the stories that we tell about kind of our learners and the things they experience today, but then what that future looks like. Right. Because, you know, as you know, like predicting or, 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 or identifying uh, with fidelity a future, particularly that far ahead, is challenging because often we lack the words, the vocabulary to describe, you know, kind of what that looks like. So that's where stories become a terrific way. Mm -hmm of describing this. And I, I think about, you know, imagine going back in time and telling people of previous eras about today's right. technology, yeah. how would you possibly describe it? You know, I imagine going back just to, you know, right. middle school, that was 30 years ago and telling, you know, I used to say to my middle school math teacher, Mrs. Ashley, like, why do I need to learn this stuff? I got a calculator. I'll just do right. that. Yeah. And she'd be like, well, it's not like you're going to have a calculator everywhere you go. Well, uh, well, what about that? I do actually. I carry one on me everywhere, and I used to calculate tips in restaurants all the time. So it's it's the you know. So part of it is is that based on our understanding today, like if we can describe that future and tell stories about it, that helps us kind of build a trajectory and make. And the other thing it does is it it helps seed conversations today, right? And and how what are the steps that we're taking today to to essentially achieve this future that we imagine for our for our students. Oh, very nice. Um, always happy. I mean, this is, you know, you're singing our song here in the forum. We're all about storytelling. We're all, of course, about the future. I'm glad to hear it, Kyle. And uh, Angela, uh, how does this connect to your work at uh, Open? Um, at Open <laughs> <laughs> At open Culture? I love just being open. We're just open. Yeah. <laughs> We've crossed that threshold. It's a threshold concept. No, uh, you know, I want to echo the sentiments of my colleagues here. Um, I, anytime we're going to be talking about literacies, anytime we're going to be talking about curiosity and looking around the corner and um, doing so uh, through that lens of storytelling that will help us move minds and hearts. Um, that's a space that not only do I want to be in, do I want to be a part of, but I also know that that 
uh, is something that we have to protect and we have to, to work on. Um, a lot of times when we talk about uh, culture and communities coming together, it's sort of in a deficit mindset. If we had to form this because things were not serving us um, or you know, there was some sort of disconnect. And this has been born of uh, a culture that is inclusive with a lot of runways into the work. I would say that in the short amount of time that we've been uh, working together and doing quite a bit, um, we have welcomed all sorts of folks into the space and uh, the community brings together folks from not only higher ed, but education adjacent, looking at industries, looking at or industry partners, looking at all sorts of connections to the work that we're doing. And I'll go back to that, uh, that celestial metaphor from before. It really does build out this constellation as opposed to single stars that we're just picking out of the sky. We really are so deeply connected. And some of the vectors uh, that we've seen lately in terms of generative AI uh, and its evolution in terms of the pandemic have reminded us that everything that we do at different levels of education into a future of work that we can't even see and imagine right now will require us to all have those futures literacies and will require us to work together in some amazing ways. So when I break it down and I think about what's sort of the secret sauce here, um, I do think about that lens of culture, that it's you know the collaborative piece of how we work together. It's that creative piece of what we generate. Um, we're not just talk, we're actually leading to generative action. And that connective piece that uh, we're creating points of engagement uh, that are in service to, to our learners. So that's really what has brought me into this and why you will uh, never stop hearing me <laughs> calling for folks to come out and, and join the effort because there's, there's room at the table for all of us and we all need to be here. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I love how how distinct each member of the constellation is. How you each have a, a different a different take on this, um, friends. Uh, I would like to uh, get out of the way and take your questions and your thoughts. Uh, what do you think about this hundred year ed tech project? Do you have basic questions? Um, do you have questions of what they're finding? Do you have any uh, recommendations for things for them to work on? Um, and uh, what would you like to know from them? Um, so we already have a question coming in from one of our good friends on, uh, in Malta, uh, Phil Lingard. Uh, he asks this, to what extent do you see virtual reality, either on-screen simulations or in the use of wearables, playing a role? So who wants to tackle that one? You know, I'll, I'll jump in on that, uh, Brian. You know, that's where uh, for Arizona State University, we've been working, uh, you know, deeply in the last couple of years around development of our dreamscape learn platform and one of the unique pieces of this and, and just to kind of continue to pull on that storytelling thread uh is to leverage kind of the use of uh, narratives to teach uh topics in, tra in, in non-traditional ways so in this case uh we started with biology and and many of us you know learned biology by doing things like dissecting frogs um and so you know dissecting a frog often teaches you how to convince other people how to do all the cutting uh, and things like that, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, speak to what are the actual learning outcomes we want from a, a biology perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because all of us come from different locations, but many of us had that same experience as if there's one right way to teach it. Um, and so that's where, you know, working using uh, virtual reality, we can bring students into these narrative based environments to learn biology. In this case, they're brought into an alien zoo and they're working with alien creatures that 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 exhibit the same kind of physiology that animals here on earth do and they can learn and what that does is it develops empathy it develops kind of um uh, a sense of fear and humor and and so many different kind of emotional connections that really sticks with students and so that's where using virtual reality particularly in these narrative forms really becomes a part of the future not just as a technology but rather transforming what those experiences look like so that we can move them away from how we've historically done it and what is it going to look like uh, definitely going into the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one really solid answer. Um, anyone else want to tackle VR for Philip? I do only because this is also captured in the 2074 guide and um, it, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Mu Memorial Museum um, was present at the summit and they are working with Google and Google public sector on extensive work to recreate actual scenes, real scenes uh, in VR. Mm -hmm. And so 
just thinking about one of our topics, two of our topics, teaching in a post-truth era and uh, XR, extended reality and historical revisionism, really calls into question or prompts one to think about what the role of education institutions like museums are in the future in terms of safeguarding realities and helping the general public understand and empathize with experiences. Um, so for me, I think um, when we think about potential, and um, sorry about the background noise there, VR, um, it's about um, less about the technology itself that is definitely advancing and we're able to, uh, sorry, I don't know where that's coming from, but I am shutting, okay, it's actually not there. Ah. Um, <laughs> so um, I just wanna, I just wanna share that um, I think it's all about in service of what the impact is what you want to see. So actually guiding the development of VR and the testing of VR for those types of experiences and making sure there's representation when they're designed is a skill set and a necessity of the future. And it's going to take technologists, it's going to take education professionals, it's going to take a lot of groups. Sam, I think you started to tease out the piece that I wanted to add and just that we have this unique opportunity in this moment in time, not only to bring people into these spaces and, you know, the early VR, AR, XR work that we saw was really around like medical professions and giving people more uh, time on these experiential tasks. But I was actually at ASU listening to one of the professors from Cronkite talking about um, the propensity for VR to be a point of creating culturally affirming curriculum and culturally affirming teaching. So not only bringing people into worlds that they wouldn't typically understand and see, but also seeing themselves in different worlds. And um, not to, you know, be the the person to bring it back to literacies again, but that's really what we're talking about here. It's understanding storytelling from a from a place of building that empathy and, and building connections through a uh, curriculum that represents all of the, the learners that we're serving. So it's an exciting time, but it's going to take a lot of us having these multimodal skills. We're going to have to be um, able to work in different environments and create meaning um, and create connection, not only with words, but uh, in a lot of different ways. So we want our learners to have those skills and they can help to build that that future of education that we're going towards. Interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Melissa, did you want to chime in? Well, yeah, I would just, I would only add, it, it, you know, we've, um, like Kyle, we're not as far down the road, but we're using VR in our astronomy program. We have a really energetic faculty sure. member, Chris Packham, and he's done some awesome work. And in terms of taking people to the future, there's no better way to do it than through space. And it's been really transformative because going back to my my conversation about impact, we made sure that the students in that class and the other faculty who were working in it, he did a course that he it was combined with the philosophy of space. So it was also yeah. interdisciplinary, along with being first time using VR. I mean, what we heard was really unexpected and expected that it made them realize the connector points between sort of the spiritual and the and the and the real it mm. helps visualize things they hadn't thought about ever before and i think in terms of developing future literacies and resilience you know nobody says that word but it's a resilient mind it's an intellectual um mm. facility to be able to move back and forth and think ahead and think backwards and then also see the connections. And I think, you know, we're gonna, we're doing that course again, but as a first effort of bringing together, not necessarily always connected disciplines and using VR as a primary vehicle, super, um, super great experience. And my other experience with it was years ago at a previous institution where we had a faculty member using VR to help his students understand before they went on study abroad you were going to Paris, you could see Paris in the 1800s. You could imagine Paris in, you know, 100 years from now and students would study that and learn about those things and visualize themselves and develop empathy along with that and a cultural understanding and then go to those countries. And again, this is a 10 or 15 year old example, but a really at that time cutting edge and still relevant way that we're thinking about it. So. Uh, this is this is fascinating. I mean, first of all, uh, Philip, thank you for the great question. 
Um, and I love how everybody uh, had different uh, different views and, and different ways of, of, of this going. Um, the uh, one question I, I, I have for all of you, building on, on Philip just really, really quickly is, um, do you think we are headed slowly but surely towards a, a future where XR becomes the dominant way that we interact with information, that we, you know, we do everything with goggles or headsets and, and so on? Or does that remain a niche used mostly for spectacular visualizations like Future Paris, so that kind of thing? What do you think? XR for everyone, or 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 does XR remain a kind of power tool for certain purposes? I, I'd love the technology to move there. I think that you know what we've learned, uh, you know, from the hype cycle of the metaverse and the work within Meta is that there's great promise, but we still have a lot of issues with equitable access to technology. So we want to make sure that wherever we're putting our money and our resources and our time and even um, you know the education that we're building around that, we're not leaving huge swaths of learners behind. So um, I want to say yes, but I want to say yes if all of us can come on the spaceship first <laughs> before we, we launch off into that new future. Mm. Yeah, I, I also think, oh, I'm sorry, go Kyle. No, please, Sip, go ahead. Oh, thank you. I just think that oftentimes there's back, there's generally big backlashes when there's like a huge movement, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to connect us all. And right now I'm, we're seeing, and I think a lot, especially really relevant to me, to um, parents of children as they enter the social media phase and grapple with things that we didn't necessarily when we were their age. And so we're starting to see campaigns around social media ages and mm -hmm. you know, how old do you need to be right. to use AI and this and that. And so like, it's n n that doesn't perfectly equate to the XR situation, but I think potentially what could happen is I think our understanding is when there's too much technology separating us physically, there's loneliness mm -hmm. um, and there's, um, you know, there's well being to think about. So I think across whether it's a hundred years or a thousand years, I think it's always going to be um, humanity and technology and trying to strike that balance. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, that's a good waffling from all four of you. Um, I, uh... <laughs> I, sorry, Kyle. I didn't mean, I, didn't, I want to hear what he has to say too. Oh, <laughs> not, not, so I, I was just uh, going to kind of build on uh, Angela's point, which is, which is an important one. And, and that's the, you know, hinging or connecting the future to any one technology mm -hmm it isn't necessarily a great strategy, right? And that's where, because we, again, historic, historically, you know, we've learned that, that that's not how it plays out in unpredictable ways. And part of what we have to focus on are like, what are the affordances? What are the things that that, mm -hmm. that technology mm -hmm. is enabling us to do? So is it about everybody having headsets to have these experiences in the future? No, I don't believe so. But it's not to say that that's not a part of that uh, part of that equation, the, but the key is is that the ways that we're seeing this being brought to bear, the ability to provide immersive experiences, the ways that we can use it to portray stories, to visualize data, to create interactivity, to right. to host uh, and deliver gaming, right? That the the modalities will continue to get increasingly more diverse, uh, and new technologies will continue to emerge. So I think, and that's where again speaking to how the 100 year project looks at this, we can look at those shifts and changes over time and say, you know what, it's not about any particular technology today, but rather what is what is the affordance that we're going to see into the future? And what do we, you know, how do we want that to manifest for, for learners? Well, that's really well said. I mean, the affordances are key here um, in so many ways, uh, as well as also, I think, a sense of convenience. Um, well, yeah. for, I, th this is a great question. Uh, and and if, if you're new to the forum, this is an example of a Q&A box question. Uh, and we have a stack of these coming up. And I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to, to, to talk. Uh, forgive me, Melissa and Kyle. I want to make sure that uh, I want to make sure you get a chance to address uh, all of these as they come in. Uh, we have a really great one from uh, Heidi Hendershot at Fisher College. It says, I continue to be worried about the digital tech divide widening during these times. Mm -hmm. Many new resources are open source and can be free. Access to VR goggles and training costs money. So, what do you all think about the digital divide, both you know, based on what you've learned from looking back fifty years and looking ahead fifty years? I think it's real. I mean, it it, it access. It's a privilege for so many to have access to 
tools. And I think that um, not all tools are equal and we lionize the opportunity that things provide that may or may not actually ever improve the lives of a lot of people. And so I think to Angela's point um, earlier on to the last question, front and center as we talk about all of this has to be about how do we make sure that the availability, the access, the key elements of what we're talking about are available broadly so that we aren't just deepening the divides that already exist. And, 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 and we become enamored with the latest tool and the latest opportunity. I've seen colleagues go down the metaverse rabbit hole like I'm betting my career on the metaverse. Well, I don't know, um, maybe, but, but maybe we need to back out a little bit and think about what it is we're trying to accomplish and how tools either create new opportunities the stories that we're telling or, 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 or not. And um, one of the most basic things that we really um, embraced around generative AI is how it helps deepen students' understanding of critical thinking. And I think that there are some base values that need to also underpin. But yes, I, I think that it has the potential to deepen the di di digital divide made worse by sometimes how enamored we become with the latest thing that's coming down the pipe. Thank you. And I think there's, you know, kind of definitely new questions that get raised inside oh, of this. And that's, and, you know, uh, the last several years with the pandemic definitely underscored the divide that still exists in terms of stable access to the internet um, in some communities. And so there's a continued need, not even with future technology, but with contemporary and current technologies uh, to yeah. continue to scale that out. Uh, but then with generative AI, like there's a whole new lens with which to mm -hmm. examine and think about equity and thinking about, you know, a couple of things. One, where are equity gaps that can be the AI can help us address? And one of those that we're beginning to explore is around kind of creative expression. And mm -hmm. so that, you know, helping a student not be limited by their technical skill right. in terms of the, their ability to express and tell a story or to share their ideas or to kind of collaborate in groups. Uh, in the ways that AI can help help do that. Uh, but then the other part of it is, is the ways that AI can help support a learner. Um, and that looks different kind of course to course, discipline to discipline. Um, some really incredible work happening in composition right now. And many of us have had, I know it certainly was true for me, kind of having ideas in my mind and how do I get those into what I'm trying to say and having that kind of mental block. And, and, and students are beginning to see AI as a way to help visualize their writing in new ways. And, yeah. and they'll take on riskier topics or go deeper into things that they may not have felt comfortable with before. So I think yeah. that's when we talk about the digital divide. Like there's so many different ways of looking at it now. And it's even more important uh, that we continue to have that kind of front and center uh, as a goal in these technology initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. I, I these are great answers. I, I want I want the rest of you to hold on for a second. So we've got more of these questions coming down the pike. And I, I think, uh, Heidi, this was a great question to ask. And I, I think people should be keeping this in mind as much as possible, which does lead up to Shelby's great question. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, let's use Shelby's question. This is a big one. Um, and this is a kind of top level question. Uh, what are some of the broader trends you see emerging from the thousands of ed tech products? Uh, what seems the most promising and what seems the most threatening? Who wants to take a run at a couple of these? I can jump in. I think that, and again, folks that know me will not be surprised by my answer here. I think that the ed tech products that are most exciting to me are the ones that are fostering uh, us to be creative in times of constraint. I think that this relates a little bit to the question that we were just tackling and, and grappling with. Uh, quite often, you know, we think of innovation as the sort of beautiful and lofty thing. And in actuality, um, it comes from challenge. It comes from despair. It comes from an uncomfortable and sort of tense place. And there are a lot of products that are out there right now. Um, and I feel like I'm going back to my old ID days um, where you have a tool that is free and it can get you about 60% of the way. What can you do uh, to couple that with another free tool or with something that you have access to? Um, and that sort of ingenuity, that um, ability to cobble pieces together to build something new and to create, um, that's an important skill that I think that um, 
we should all have not only that skill and that ability, but the creative confidence that comes uh, behind it. I hope that's not a non-answer to that question, but I think that um, beyond using individual tools, being able to be comfortable piloting, experimenting, playing with these things and using them perhaps in ways that um, their creators didn't intend uh, right. to create new possibilities is what excites me most. Well, I, th I think the question was less about the tools and the trends uh, that you see emerging from them. Um, so, you know, I, I would say rather, for example, you know, not so much the meta headset so much as XR in general or uh, hide, uh, Shelby, if I'm getting this wrong, please let me know. You know, uh, not so much, you know, open AI versus perplexity, but, you know, the idea of generative AI. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to a kind of a plus one and an amen to what uh, Angela just said, which is the, you know, the, the ability to have technology support student creativity. Historically, if we've looked at Bloom's taxonomy, we've talked about kind of technology supporting the bottom portions of Bloom's taxonomy. And what we're seeing is the ability to support the top parts around students being creative, being able to do critical analysis. So that's where, and I'm, you know, I'm sorry, we're going to kind of reinvoke AI here as a topic, but it is a, like, this is, that's one of the things that makes AI so compelling is that it does support those, the, the, that level of analysis, that deeper levels of engagement. At the same time, I will also say that this is a concerning trend because effectively, as we're seeing new products come into the space, that AI is not peanut butter. It does not automatically make everything better. We don't just spread it on and, 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 and love what we get, right? We have to be very vigilant about how these technologies are being used, how they're being incorporated into products, and to make sure that, that they are being um, in ways that actually support students and are equitable. Um, both in the functionality technology, but also in the cost models that are being provided around them. Um, and so I think that's one of the critical things that we need to keep an eye on as an industry is to make sure that, that as AI is introduced into these technologies, that it's being done in safe, responsible, mindful ways. That's a good point. That's a good yeah. point. Please, please, Hannah, go ahead. I agree with what both of my friends and colleagues have said here. Um, I'm just going to add to that by saying that I think in terms of positive trends, I think there's three things in terms of ed tech and what it helps do, which is make learning hyper personalized yeah. to individuals and at scale, meaning, you know, there are hundreds and thousands of people who never make it to higher ed as an example. Um, how are we going to give them an opportunity and also understand the challenges that they're going through and provide them with flexible opportunities? Uh, that are personalized to whatever their needs in life are, whatever their career goals are, whatever their family situation is, wherever they want to live. So that's hyper-personalized. Democratized is all about access. And I said earlier in the chat, and it bears repeating, nothing works if it doesn't work for all. Um, truly, it's just a, a tool for the privileged then, honestly. And that's really, I think, what 100-Year EdTech Project is about is I'm not saying we're a perfectly representative group at all. I think that's one of our goals is to get more people involved and engaged with different perspectives. Um, but I think um, democratizing democratizing access and technologies that foster that rather than exacerbate the divide, uh, for your point, Shelby. And then the third one I mentioned is lifelong. Um, learning is not a destination. Learning is not a higher ed thing. It's not a K-12 thing. We're all here. I think we're, we would all potentially self-identify as lifelong learners, many of us. Um, many of the places where we're employed have continuing education or K-12 programs. And so it's very much about um, technology conversations and the tools we're using, kind of busting through the vacuum, busting through the, kind of the different sectors uniting them and making sure that technology is in service of aiding people who have their learning journeys from age zero to age 100 or whatever is life expect life expectancy grows um and the real threat the real threat is not listening uh continuing to create products that are in search of problems that don't exist uh and not using them with real people and understanding their needs and um I don't want to belabor it, but as someone who I think initially came to Future Transform as uh, someone involved in the Horizon Report and writing those, you could look at the technologies that were written about and in in tracked in 2014 and 2016. Shocker, it was AI back then, right? Um, you could also look at the trends and the challenges, and I'll tell you, they really haven't changed. They're still important. They're all about expanding access. It's about open content. It's about making sure that we're being, uh, you know, thinking global, acting local. And so I think 
to throw a crux, you know, and what we mean by the next 100 year project is not necessarily just about change. It's about the things that are in our values as humanity that are not changing and that stay the same. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, quite. Um, okay. Please, please go ahead. Uh, no, I, I, I'm going to just add three things because actually, Sam, you you picked up several of the comments that I was going to make. So good job. Huh? <laughs> uh, but I think that if I look at generative AI and some of what we have out right now, it creates opportunities for um, people to be curious in ways that they wouldn't have been previously. And I happen to think that um, inflaming internal curiosity and keeping that alive is mm. a key to continual growth, success, creativity, and innovation. And the ability to sit with chat or whatever, ask stuff, check it out, low risk it is a low risk environment and we hear this from our students they're like really happy that they don't have to feel embarrassed asking questions that they aren't sure about but that they can do they can take a little bit more agency in doing tracking and checking things on their own which is personalized learning but expressed in ways that tell stories it's a person's story and and so i think that low risk keeping the light of curiosity alive and in fact growing important and then what when we worked with our writing program which was our really early both writing and math jumped into generative ai very early on but we also heard utsa is a very diverse campus and we're really proud of that and proud of our of our obligation and our and our authentic commitment to making sure that all students succeed we heard from our students that it was like so nice to be able to use generative AI to, and I talked about this earlier, to ask questions they would have been embarrassed to ask of mm -hmm. even a tutor. And so it, we found that with students who um, might need more or have wanted more, and it, they felt more comfortable using chat than they did any of our other services. It's not the only thing, but if it's a door, it's an entry point that makes you feel more confident to go down another road, super important. So those are, you know, hopefully trends that can continue, but I wanted to toss those out. Thank you, thank you. In in the chat, um, I'm gonna mispronounce this person's name. I think it's uh, Wagene says, is it not the digital divide is a multifaceted issue? The core inequalities that perpetuate the divide are deeply rooted in larger socioeconomic structures. Um, yeah, which is, uh, thank you all for This is uh, a great answer to a really, really good question. Um, thank you uh, for the question as well. We have um, one big question from uh, a dear friend in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, and this is the kind of one to, to wrap things up because we're actually coming close to the end of the hour now. Uh, and this is a feisty question, uh, and, but I think you guys should be able to handle this pretty, pretty productively. I'm not clear what the cash value you feel studying 100 years of EdTech brings. How will your work help understanding the use of EdTech? How could the past help learners in the future? And this is from John Hollenbeck. First of all, I think it's funny that you think we're in it to make money. Um, and that <laughs> any of us here are, so that is funny and feisty. Um, I, I also, I think really what we're trying to do is provide guidance and a lens for people to do better strategic planning that's more inclusive of more stakeholders and even an intergenerational audience. There's a you know unique framework that we have and it's also about using stories, future stories as a way, whether it's a system, an institution, a school, a district, a region of the world. Um, it's also really about the process we're creating here for future li futures literacies. Hopefully I said that right, Angela. Uh, so yeah, so um, so that to me is invaluable. L like we said, some of the trends really are patterns. They're not changing much, you know, the tools, but um, it's really about having that mindset and that skill set, in my opinion. I'd like to take it to my other colleagues too. Thanks. Thank you. I mean, I actually, yeah, it's definitely not a money making project. Uh, higher ed's not known for being really light on its feet. And I mean, broadly, it's known for kind of replicating what it does. There are pockets of super innovative and creative areas and, and research who do, researchers who do amazing work. But the whole organization of higher education 
Not so much. I, I had a conversation about a week and a half ago with a um, former colleague who said, you know, do you realize that like the, the staffing and residence life, those job descriptions haven't probably changed in 75 years and the whole world has changed. So if we're able to provoke some curiosity and thinking through storytelling, through introduction to different technology, to talking about trends, to whatever we're doing that aligns to this project, that gets a 1% bump in um, higher ed's ability to think bigger, to move more quickly, or to just be more embracing of um, out of the box opportunities and looking ahead and around corners, it's totally worth it. So that's mm. what I would say. Mm, nice, continuing trends and the ability to look ahead. Thank you, thank you both. Uh, Kyle, why don't you give us a shot? Yeah, well, you know, and I think part of this is the opportunity to explore what are complex topics that we really do need to confront and, and work with. And so that's where it's less so about kind of the, the cash value of the solution, but rather the cost of not exploring and not taking on uh, these bigger issues that can become you know areas where we can support our students, that we can provide greater degrees of access to learning, that, that we can begin to address the future challenges, the future workplace and the future skills. And I think in all of that starts with kind of having these deep conversations. I love how uh, Melissa put it, which is kind of thinking bigger about some of these things. And that's where that's the value, right? Which is that how can we help kind of students plan for and prepare their future selves? And part of that is that we, we need to do the same is to think about, OK, what do we look like kind of going into the future? Mm, what do we look like? No, that's a good way of putting it. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Angela, what would you like to add? Yeah, I'm going to bring it back to the access discussion that we had right before this. Um, access not only uh, is something that we have to look at through that lens of power and privilege for our students, but for ourselves as well. Uh, the affordances of us getting together, and I think about all of us, you know, spending how many dollars to fly to a location for a conference and pay for a hotel and spend all of that time uh, together is is incredibly precious. And um, it's quite possible for us to go to an event where we can sit back passively, um, you know, listen to people talk about constructivist learning as we're taking in the learning like a like a sponge as if that was even possible. But this is really giving a new framing and a new take on this of how do we actually process our pasts, our collective, uh, very, very different pasts in order to look at the future, uh, contending that we can build anything if we work together in new ways, in different ways, um, but only if we're uh, doing so in a way that centers around our values and generative action. So um, the thing for me in terms of the value is that it's a space for us to all contribute and to do this work together, not to sort of ponder and think and pontificate and then go back to our institutions, back to our homes and then do the work. Um, we have the ability to, to get our hands dirty. The other thing too that we have not talked about at all is that these events feature students first and foremost as attendees, not just like, hey, here's a student panel. This is cool. We're hearing from some students, but students are in the collaborative teams working shoulder to shoulder with educators from all across the country and across the globe. Um, so we're not waiting to pass on that goodness. We're we're doing it together. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, oh, well, first of all, John, thank you for the for the great question, which is clearly provocative in a very positive way. Um, and I appreciate you following up in the chat with everything from uh, William James to questions of pricing. Um, thank you all for for your answers to this, but also to all the all other questions. This has been a great hour that's just sped by really, really super fast. Um, let me ask, um, what's the best way to keep up with the project? Is it the main site or should we uh, um, aim for the 2025 design summit? Um, and oh. uh, okay. do you have a newsletter or uh, our, a regular blog? What's the, what's the best way to keep up? Great question. So definitely the website's the best place because there you're going to be able to navigate to the 2025 summit with information for how to get an invitation and go. Um, and then there's also a LinkedIn group where we more in informally share updates with each other. That's I think now 200 people strong. And so the website will get you to a form where you can apply for an invitation. If you're feeling shy and not ready yet and want to dip your toe in the 100 year pond, 
that's fine. You could also just sign up for email lists for our email list. We won't spam you. We just let you know when we're appearing <laughs> on the Future Trends Forum or opening registration. Uh, so really hope to see you in San Antonio at the fantastic yeah. UTSA. It'll be fun. Well, great. Um, well, we're looking forward to that and looking forward to keeping up with the group. In the meantime, uh, Kyle, we have to uh, release you back on the on the students. Um, and Melissa, uh, you're probably going to be encountering more than a few of those critters as well. Uh, Sam, speaking of critters, you have a lot of critters to uh, to wrangle for the last couple of weeks. Not to mention, I'm speaking of clients here. Um, and uh, and and of course, Angela, you have to keep working open open uh, through you know into the far future. <laughs> so it's, it's a real pleasure talking with all of you. Please please be well, and uh, and we're going to try and keep in touch. Um, and uh, next year, we're going to bring a hundred years of ed tech back and uh, right. to the food. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you in 2075. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Bye bye. Thank you. Don't go away yet, friends. Um, I need to point out where things are headed for the next uh, uh, for the next few weeks. And let me just stop making my face all gigantic like that. Um, we uh, thank you for the great questions. By the way, um, this has been really really helpful. Uh, we have a whole series of, uh, of, of places where you can have this kind of conversation continuing. If you're interested in issues of the digital divide or how to think about this in a 100-year framework, uh, just use the hashtag FTTE and head to Twitter or to LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, or Blue Sky, uh, not to mention my blog. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, including our sessions with the 100 Years of Ed Tech Project, as well as many others in educational technology, just go to our archive at tinyurl.com slash FTFarchive. We have sessions coming up uh, on all kinds of topics. Uh, you can find them at forum.futureofeducation.us. And once again, thank you for all of your questions and comments. I really appreciate this conversation. Uh, we're entering uh, into the fall, uh, or at least late 2024 semester. I hope everybody is excited, productive, and best of all, safe and sound. We'll talk to you later online next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>